Like we've been telling you, these series are for everybody. So today we're talking about connect with your kids. And so uh, put your hand up if you have absolutely no contact with children ever. Okay, so then definitely this sermon is for you today. Okay, so um, as we uh, looked at these different titles, it was one of the ones that I liked the most because probably one of my greatest passions is children. And uh, there are certain areas, probably marriage and, and kids are like my yeah, go-to kind of things. And so uh, kids are very uh, close to my heart. So I'm going to give you, there was just so many scriptures and stories I could share with you, but I'm going to give you some practical things today and uh, give you a couple of scriptures there and stories. But you only got to read the Word of God to know how Father feels about children. He actually talks about woe to you who, you know, does things to kids. It's like someone who ties a millstone. Now, when we push kids away from the things of God, so we're going to look at areas that that can happen in our life. So number one, I think it's not really number one. It is the only one. Number one you need to realize is kids are human beings, okay? And... And I'm serious, I think sometimes we forget because we become adults and we somehow, even though we don't use the words, we think that we're better than them, we don't count them. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, the amount of times like I'll, I'll ask even different service coordinators or some of the pastoral team about someone and they'll only ever usually tell me the adults that came. It's like that, they're, they're, they're the people and then, oh yeah, I, I don't know. But you know, the kids in this church are important. Every child that you come across in society is important. You probably noticed today my son-in-law seems very um, unattentive. He's in and out of uh, the door. He's on his mobile phone. How, how disgraceful does that seem? That's actually because he's on call. So Friday night at youth group, he was out on his phone for about an hour. Uh, with a, a situation, so he, he works connected with DCP, so four kids have been taken to daycare and left there. No one's coming to pick them up, no one has any intention of picking them up and so his job is to try and house them, find where they can go and stuff like that. Kids are important. Kids are so important and there are kids out there that are dealing with major issues like that and then there's every kid's like the one sitting next to you the ones that you have to take home, that you hope DCP sometimes takes. And you've considered leaving your kids at daycare sometimes. Uh, you may laugh, but I bet you have. It's like, what time do they close? So, um, And so they, they are so important. I remember uh, recently when Joey and Keita were um, almost due to have their baby and me trying to be encouraging, I was saying to Joey, how amazing is this? I was like, do you think soon, in, in a few more weeks, God is going to entrust you with a human being that belongs to him and he's going to give you the next 18 years to mould and, and look after that kid and everything that it learns and it knows will come through you. I thought they were words of encouragement and I uh, Joey was like, gosh, Pastor Jane, you are freaking me out here. You know, that was my encouragement words. And, and so, you know, I just know that for sure that you need to understand you didn't decide to have children. God decided to give you children. And that's an inc incredible privilege to, to have them and look after them. Notice I threw in that little thing of 18 years. Okay, because some of you are still got a 28-year-old that you're looking after that God never intended that to happen. And I'm going to cut touch on a few things like that afterwards. So, you know, I want you to, to think about when we become a parent, one of the most th important things as a parent is the way you live and what you do. See, it's not about what I say and it's not about what I post. I see some amazing family photos of people on Facebook. Here we are. But what's happened, you know, you just screamed at them for the last hour. I told you not to pull that face. Abby, sit down, da 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 do this. And we're trying to get that nice photo, yeah, to show everybody, to just get, get it together. And, the, and we're just trying to show everyone we're having a lovely time at uh, wherever we are, Bayswater wa Waves or, or whatever, you know, like stop pulling your sister's hair, stop doing these things. And we're more focused sometimes on, on what we're going to post or what we're going to show people. We walk into church. Church, you've screamed at them all the way here. You've told them mean stuff and then you walk in, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you, you sit there and your kids are like, and people are like, aren't they so well behaved? No, they're scared, okay? They are scared because you told them there is no dinner for the week if they talk during the service because we have to have respect in this place. This isn't this church, obviously, but 
other churches. So we need to understand. Pastor Tom said some powerful things last week. He talked about uh, as far as men. He said something like if, if a man attends a church, there's a 95, 94% chance that their family will come to church. That's a huge responsibility. If you're a man and you come and you serve God faithfully, there's a 94% chance that you will affect others. So there are responsibilities that come when we want to connect with kids in the things that we're doing. He talked about leading by example. Some scary things he said. You make a covenant with the electricity bill company. You make a covenant with the phone bill people. So when you don't pay that, that integrity is what we're showing our kids. Oh, that's okay. We don't have kids at home. But if they come visit your house and they see bills that are not paid on your fridge or around your life, or they hear what you've said, how you're not paying that, you affect the kids. So when we want to be connected to our kids, the way we live. And the first person I was thinking about is in the book of Genesis is Lot. Lot, you know, is a person, he, he takes his whole family away from the things of God. And the Bible says that he's sitting in a place of authority. He's at the, at the uh, gate there, which speaks of authority. And angels come and they speak to him and the angels tell him, you know, God is coming. He's going to wipe out this place and you need to go tell your family. And so Lot, because he knows it's true, especially if you generally talk to an angel, whatever they say is fairly much going to happen. And so he goes back to his family and he's like, we need to leave here because this is what's going to happen. And the Bible says his son-in-laws just think he's joking. See, sometimes maybe we can get to that point in life where something drastic happens and then you're going to say to your kids or kids around you, okay, what we need to do now is pray. And they're like, are you serious? <laughs> We've never done that before. Well, why we, we've never seen you do that. Yeah, but now we really need to because something bad has happened and we need to pray. Or now we need to go to church because things are looking desperate and your kids go, we don't normally have to go. Why are we going now? I mean, the aircon broke out. Why would you want to go to church? And so his son-in-laws don't believe him. And so his whole situation with his kids doesn't come by what he says, comes by what he's doing. And the Bible says that the son-in-laws don't go, but his daughters do go. And his daughters leave with him and his wife is already used to wanting to be back where it was. You know the story, she's turned to a pillar of assault. But the way he's morally taught his daughters. Now the Bible says that God destroyed Sodom and he starts to take them out and you go read the story, but Lot decides he wants to move to a, small, a smaller village. Okay. And then his girls get there and within a short time they start saying, there's just no men here. There's just no men around. There's no men left in the whole world. So we should get our father drunk and sleep with him. See, if you bring your kids up in that kind of moral standard, we can look at that and think that's crazy, but we're the same. Well, there's just no men around in the church, so I just got to go find one in the nightclub because that's what you did because I've never been taught a moral standard of what God is saying to do. And so the, the tribes that to this day still cause us a problem came out of incense incest, incest with girls that were never morally taught what's right and wrong. And so often we're not teaching our kids, not so much by what you tell them, but what you're living out. And this is why we want to teach on, on marriage and stuff, because we want to be able to teach them before they get into a marriage. We want to teach you before you start making strong friendships, how you should be living. So that when it's time to move, unlike Lot's family, that doesn't happen. The other thing I notice is how easy it is to notice issues in everybody else's problem house. It's amazing how easy it is to notice when someone else's kids aren't right. And uh, Lewis said this morning, no, these are not new things. No, this is not a perfect church. It's exactly the same as it was back then. Eli was the same. Eli was a priest working in the house of God. You can read this story in Samuel. Eli's running the house of God and uh, Hannah comes in and she's desiring a child. And the Bible says that she's, she's at the church. She's weeping. She's crying. She's sobbing. And Eli goes over and he rebukes her. He's like, how dare you be drunk in the house of God? And you kind of think, well, fair enough. She did look really sad and probably not part of our pastoral training on how we deal with people. But he did rebuke her. And then she said, like, I'm, I'm not actually drunk. I'm just so, so desperate. And we kind of think that story is okay. But if you actually read the story, it actually talks about Eli's sons 
who were working in the house of God were sleeping with women inside the church. And Eli never felt to go and correct his sons. The scripture actually says this um, in 1 Samuel 2.22. It says, now when Eli was old, 1 Samuel 2.22, when Eli was old, he heard everything that his sons did to Israel, how they laid with women in the assembly of the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. And he did nothing. It doesn't say he did nothing, but he obviously did nothing. In 1 Samuel 2.29, it said, Eli was told by God, why do you honour your sons more than me? And in 1 Samuel 3.13, when we know the story, when God suddenly starts coming and talking to young Samuel, um, the message had already been told. He actually says, Eli does not restrain his sons. So that's another area for us to be connected with kids. Sometimes it's looking at, you don't need to go help everybody else. Here's a great piece of advice. Write this one down. You don't need to give people advice. <laughs> okay? You don't need to give people advice. I was, I was thinking about this. We are classic with people's children, how we want to give advice, which is crazy because, man, they are, they are fighting words, okay? You used to go up and give someone advice on how to deal with their kids. They're fighting words. But you don't drive into a car park with someone and their car's running rough and you go, oh, here, do you want me to tell you how to fix your car? Or you don't go to their house and see their garden and go, here, would you like me to show you how to make your garden better? We don't correct people in other things. We don't go give advice. And often we think, yeah, but that's what we're, we're called to do. We give advice when someone asks our advice. Could you show me how to stop my child having a tantrum? Could you show me how to do this? Then that's a good place to give advice. But when we start to give advice, the problem is generally most people will look at your life. You'll look at how, excuse me, your kids shouldn't be um, getting so angry there. And they're like, I just saw you get angry last week. If they, don't, if they don't see that in us, generally people will come and ask advice when they see something good in your life. When you see a good marriage, you will go and go, could you tell me how you guys are, are doing so well? You don't look at a couple that you don't see getting on very well and go, I'll go find out how they're doing it. These people that don't have any money, I'll go ask them how they ended up so broke. So we need to just focus on ourselves. Look at, look at our, our, our lives around us and who we're connected to. Think about our business and, and what we're doing. Look at our own children where we need to restrain. I think adults need to take authority back in the home. And before you say amen, that's not about being bossy. You will do this and you will do that and you will do this. A lot of it is you taking responsibility as an adult. Because so often now what happens is we have this new... Uh, kids that we want to bring up, we want them to be independent. Well, they've got to learn how to fend for themselves. I'm just trying to train them to be responsible. Really, that's just making you irresponsible. You ask them to do things for you like, uh, can you go and answer the phone? Can you go and do this? Can you go and get this? And then when they're on your phone, you say, you shouldn't be touching my phone. Well, really, we shouldn't be giving them the freedom to do so many things. We take on things like teenagers you know, we go, oh, well, you know, that because they're teenagers. One of the things that you'll notice in this church, we don't have a middle bit, okay? You go from year six in kids' church and then you move into adult church. Then you get to have tea and coffee. You don't get to have lollies. Uh, you get to do certain things because it is unbiblical to be a teenager. Do you know, 100 years ago, there wasn't such things as teenagers, and after the Great Depression was when we invented teenagers. And what that was, was we gave you uh, response, we gave you authority, but no responsibility. And this is what's, what's caused issues for us, us now. We, we take a teenager and we go, ah, they look like a man, but they act like a child. We need to go, you know what, it, it, it's not unbiblical. When I need to train my kids that to become men, to become girls, to be able to teach them things. Young men, I want to encourage you, if you think you're a teenager, you need to realize you're a man. You need to learn to, to, to lift things. When you see someone, when you see a girl lifting something or you see someone older than you, not as in you're 18 and they're 19, you need, oh, here, let me, let me do this. One of the young memories I was carrying out, I don't even know what I was counting. And straight was like, oh, here. And I went later and I said, I honour you for that because that's what men do. 
That's what we should be training our kids to do. Not training them how to whatever, play Xbox, not training them how to do other things. And we've got to lead by example. We've got to go, yeah, fine, we'll do those things. As a, as a woman of God, I always wanted to make sure my daughter saw that I, I did the right thing. Not only when she was looking, but to be doing the right thing. To look at age-appropriate things. Okay, think about the child of your age and, and, and work out, should they be carrying, I, I love the post Rebecca put up recently, they shouldn't be carrying some of the weights. If you have children under the age of about 16 and they know debt issues that you have, they really shouldn't be knowing all of that. Yeah, well, because we can't pay that because the mortgage is more and that. Are, children were never designed. The reason children are so stressed now is you are giving them far too much weight that they just can't emotionally and physically deal with. They don't need to know that. You know, one time at Kids Club, one of the, the kids said to me, the mum, had, the dad had left and, and the kid said, Lorraine, remember that? And he said, well, my dad's certainly got the woman of his dreams now. Now that obviously came from the mum and I know as a mum or a dad or something, sometimes you're hurt, but children cannot carry that kind of weight. They can't carry those kind of pressures. If you want them to thrive being the children that God's created them to be, there are some things that you need to shield them from that they just are not emotionally and physically ready to be able to deal with. Connecting with our kids. Connecting with your kids comes as well from, if, if you're in a marriage situation, a happy marriage. Children come into security when they see that you're happy. Not because you put a happy photo up there, this is our family. Not if you make some amazing wall with all your family on it. Children know, by the way, when you leave here and you get in the car, what are you saying? How are you behaving? They're the things that make the difference. You should be able to say, every member of this church that's connected in any way with kids, you need to bring your life to a point that you can say, I want them to be just like me. I want them to be just like me. And the way we do that is to be able to position our lives better. Because especially as a parent, you should desire that. I want my kids to be just like me. Maybe the struggle you've got at the moment is they are just like you. And so we have these two different standards. Children struggle so much with different standards. And they, they're looking to see, you know, what, what, what are you doing? Because children catch what you do. They're not taught, okay? Parenting and modelling and moral is more caught than taught. So they're going to look at, and I think Pastor touched on it last week, they're going to look at your priorities. What's your priority? So you want them to do certain things and you want them, say, to be organised and remember their bag and do all these things. They look to see what your priorities are. They'll look to see how you're behaving, what are, what are you doing, and it doesn't matter how much you tell them. They'll look at what you're doing. When they're building relationships and you're trying to tell them, don't hang out with that person, they're really mean or they're really naughty or they do that, they'll look at your friends. What are your friends like? You reach a point with your teenagers where you're going to tell them things like, you shouldn't be drinking, and they're going to go, well, you drink. You shouldn't be watching these sort of movies, but you do. And then a child's mind, you say things like, well, you can't do that because you're a child. Okay, so you can do the wrong things when you're an adult, but you can't do... Th the kid's going, I don't, I don't quite get it. I don't quite get this double standard. And so they struggle and then they'll start to question you. When they get to, uh, well, some of you earlier, but when they get to about 12, they're going to start to question your behaviour. And majority of us go, listen, I'm the adult, you just do what I say. And they go, I am. That's probably where the problem comes because I'm doing what you tell me to do. Sometimes you can deal with them. They're getting angry and upset and you, you can tell them, you know, like, you know, don't get upset like that. Don't get angry like that. But they're watching to see how do you handle stress? How do you handle problems? If you are in this church and you are an adult, kids are watching you all the time. And they watch you when you come in the door and they see how you handle when you don't like something. And so when you blow off or say something or get angry or make snide comments or whatever you do, they just watched you. And they will either become like you or lower their opinion of you. And sometimes we don't like that because we're like, children should respect their elders. 
Well, a lot of elders, if you walked respectfully, they would respect you. But we're coming to a place where it doesn't matter how much you say it, your age does not give you respect. The way you live will give you respect. And kids around you, you will see, even when we do grits, kids are drawn. People like Barry and Lorraine, kids are drawn to them. It's not, oh, well, they're older and we need to respect them. They feel something. They are so connected to them by, by their behaviour, by what they do, by the way they treat them, that kids will connect to them. What are your values or your beliefs? What actions do they say to your children is so important to us because that's what's actually going to, to affect them is, is what we're doing. I was thinking about it, not that I've ever been, but if I went to a gym and the instructor was sitting there eating donuts saying, yeah, you just need to do five more of those, I'd be like, I'm not, if you're not going to get up and do it, if you're not going to live that way, I want to go, if I ever did go to a gym, I want I want to be looking at them going, I want to be just like you. That's why I want to do it. And that's how we should be no matter what age, even if our kids have left home. I want to be the best grandparents to my kids. I want to be careful that I'm, I'm calm in situations and I, I speak to them in a, in a restrained way and I, I lead them by example, not giving in to them. Kids will still thrive in really strong boundary areas. They love boundaries, but what they need is consistent boundaries. Kids struggle because you say, we can't do this, but tomorrow you can because it doesn't work for me. We don't do this. We go to church on Sunday, except actually this week doesn't work for us. So now, and the kid's like, do, do we go? Do we, do we not go? Uh, you do not speak badly about people. Yeah, but you do. And I, I hear what you say. And so kids get very confused. And they soon learn that if, if the house is divided, it's going to fall. So in your family home, I want to encourage you if, you, if you are married, to stay strong and united because that speaks volumes to kids when they can see that you are united. Now, that doesn't mean that you always agree, but you have to find ways to, to work on that, to uh, be able to do that. If you're, if you're in your home and you're teaching kids and they constantly see that you are critical, you criticise people. You whinge about people. You know, you, you go home today and you, you're going to say something that you didn't like and you didn't do or whatever. Your kids will learn exactly how to do that. And so the issue generally is your kids are what you've created them to be because kids don't have filters. So they tell people things. Yeah, my mum said that you preach too long. Oh, okay. Uh, my, my, uh, my dad says... Um, and lady, you're, like, you're not supposed to say that. And they're like, why? I thought that's what we believed. Some of you guys, it's scary to put them on that other side of the wall there because they say things. Because kids don't get, because you told them to be honest. You told them to tell the truth. And so they tell the truth. But you only want them to tell the truth sometimes. Do they learn to be critical, negative and angry from what we're saying? Or are they seeing a good example? As we stay united, you know, you, as, as parents, you know, so often it'll be like, you know, when you're making a decision, you know, when your kids ask you stuff, you should always go away. And go away doesn't mean in the kitchen while they're watching telly. Trust me, they hear you. Okay. When I say go somewhere, your kids don't. Sometimes I'm talking to them, they're like, oh, no, they're, they're playing. They're listening. They are listening. Okay, they hear everything. So you pick a time where you can actually go away from your kids and you talk. Okay, Rebecca wants to go to this party. I don't really think it's a good idea. What do you think? Da 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 da. And he'll he'll you know might say something. Then you come back united. If you come back saying, "Look, I would have said yeah, but Dad said no. He doesn't think it." Then the kid just knows that there's an issue there. So you never come back with it. You always got to back each other. Now, there might be a place where you're still going to disagree. Well, I actually think she should be allowed to go, but, but we still go out of the room united to say to our kids. When we're making comments to your kids like, you know, well, I would have, but Dad won't, you, you become disunited. Is that a word? Disunited. You need to honour each other in front of your kids. The other thing with your kids is don't play bad cop, good cop. And, and can you do me a favour, don't play good parent, bad pastor, because that's a very common one. Okay, when you want to tell your kids to do something, but you don't kind of want to, it's like, well, if Pastor Jane knew you were doing that, 
Okay, that's a cop-out, okay? Well, Pastor Tom, if he knew you were going to wear that skirt, what would Pastor Tom say about that? What would you as a parent say? And as, as parents, we need to stand united. We love you, but this is why we want you to do it. And when it's done in a calm and loving way, whatever the decision might be, kids feel so secure when they see that unity. That unity can go one step further for, for me now. Like I've got like eight grandkids and stuff. And there are things that my kids will do that I don't agree with. And so there's a time where I'll get with them and I'll talk to them away from their kids. And they might say, well, we think it's okay. And I'm like, I just kind of struggle with this. And, and we'll, you know, my job really in, in majority of times is to submit under what they feel as parents because they're the parents. And I can still talk to them, yeah, I would just find that really hard. And we come to an agreement. But when I come out in their kids, I'm going to say, oh, look at, you know, no. Even if it's a small thing, they'll ask, can we come to your house and, and play? Well, we love that. So it's like, yeah. we're like, no, your daddy said you can't. We would love you to come, but daddy said you can't. So then the kids hate daddy. We're like, no, we'd love you to have come over, but today doesn't really work, so we'll organise another time. United, united now with my, my kids, united now with my grandkids, united now with other kids that are around me to do those things. They come to kids club and they're, I don't know, they're kindy. You know, again, like, well, no, I'd like to have you, but Pastor Jane said that you have to be in pre-primary. We're really sorry. Well, they'd like to move. I know they're only in, in creche, but they'd like to go to Pulse. Well, look, we'd love you to go to Pulse. I know you're only four, but Pastor Jane said you can't. You know, it, it doesn't so it doesn't connect you with your kids. It doesn't connect you. The way we communicate with them, the way we build bridges with them, the way they're going to learn how to respect and to honour is as we honour and respect each other. Lewis touched on this today. The way we speak to people, the way we speak about people. Our kids are like radars. They're listening. They're listening to you here in church. They're listening to you out in the car park. They're listening to you at home. They're listening if you're a school teacher. They're listening if you're in a workplace. Wherever you might be, kids are listening. And out of that listening, you are building people for God. You are building people for God. And so God is looking at, you know, how we're going to do this. Both parents need to discipline. These are some key things. So you need to communicate. You need to unite together. Both parents need to discipline. If a child constantly hears when your dad gets home, then dad's the ogre and mum's the nice one. Or you give it to them and they leave all the hard things, say even to the wife sometimes. Discipline should be on both sides. That both of you are disciplining your kids on a, on a regular basis where it needs to be. Calm discipline. If you, you know, if you uh, believe in, in smacking, we believed in smacking, didn't we? So we'd take it in turns to use the little slipper, wouldn't we, darling? She'd used to say, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather dad hit me. <laughs> See? Yes. Because she said, mum's just like so calm and calculating and she'll just like come down and she's going to hurt you, but dad's scared he will hurt you, so he's more gentle. So she used to say, please send dad, please send dad. But we just take it in turns just to make it even. But it's, it's so important. Both parents need to emotionally and physically connect with their kids. Oh, well, they need a hug. Go to your mum. <laughs> She's crying. <laughs> I don't know how to do crying. You know, I love it now that, you know, young dads like Joey, it's like he's got the back. Because so often we've grown up like, okay, there's a problem, give it. When love's needed, send it to the mum. No, when love's needed, send it to the dad. This is why so many young girls are going out looking for attention so young because they need the love of a father. They need a dad to be able to hug you. To this day, if she's sad, she'll still go to her dad and her dad will hug her and love her. So emotionally, both parents need to be connected. Sometimes it might be a matter of just getting some, some help, some counselling, some mentoring, whatever you want to call it. You know, Bree and Nathan have just recently brought a puppy and I love it they've enrolled it in puppy school and she's like, I know it's a bit expensive but it's important. I wish parents would enrol in parenting school. 
because we'll pay out for other things. But sometimes to be a parent, it didn't come with a manual. It didn't come with all the answers. And we're too prideful to get with people who've walked a bit further and gone, we don't really know how to deal this. We don't know how to do this. Anything you buy constantly needs fixing and maintaining. And yet we don't want to do that as parents. We want to produce some kids and then never ask anyone's advice. And never get help. You know, help is getting wisdom off someone is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength to be able to go, you know, I can, I can help in that. I'm trying to pick, there's so many things. I'm trying to keep it to a time thing. Well, you know, if you're dealing with a child that's not, uh, w- well, what's the word? Restraint. They're a little bit active. You know, and we're, we, you know, you're constantly just yelling, don't do this, stop doing that. If you have a child that finds it harm, hard to self-regulate, then there's a place that you're going to have to teach them nicely, nicely, because they're, they're struggling with that. Like they have outbursts, you know, like when I look at things like ADD and we're worried it's a, it's a new thing, read about Moses, okay, because I am sure that guy had some major Uh, restraint issues and probably was ADD. The Bible talks about in uh, after he's, uh, it says when Moses was grown up, okay, when Moses was grown up, remember he goes out and he sees the Egyptian and the Israelite and the Bible says he looks left to right, he sees no one so he just whacks and kills the, um, the Egyptian. Like he had a lot of power. He could have said like I'm from the throne, I'm from the throne, I'm in the line. He lived with Pharaoh, could have said right that's it. He didn't, he couldn't help himself. And maybe you've got a kid like that that sometimes just can't help themselves. I just killed the kid in the playground. I'm sorry. So I'm going to run away. Okay. And you know the story how he, he um, hit the rock. But do you know also he did it before that. I'll give you some scriptures later. When he was told, Jesus came, uh, sorry, God told him to um, wipe the, the lentils with the blood. The lent, is that how you say it? The doorpost, anyway. And the Bible says he goes and he tells the people, strike the doorposts. And I read, the Lord said, put blood. He said, strike blood. He had a little bit of self-control issue. He came down with the Ten Commandments. He's the first person to ever break the Ten Commandments because he walks down, he can't help himself, and he just smashes them because people are He had some self-control issues. So you can kind of look at your little kid, Johnny, that you're trying to, instead of always yelling at him, stop, or be calm, or have self-control, and go, maybe they're struggling with that. If Moses struggled and God used him, then I can take my little Johnny, and I can just try and bring him alongside and just develop that and help that. Stop screaming at your kids. Stop yelling at your kids thinking that, because they will just then take that on board. One of the ways, if you've got a child that doesn't listen well, and you is, I always say to people, Make sure you're touching the child when you need to talk to them because that will stop you from getting angry. Just if you've got to touch them, I needed you to put your toys away today. Now, some of you are like, it's fine for you. You're not the parent in my house. But I'm telling you, it will. No, she wasn't. She was a good girl. She was a good girl. Ignore that. Let me have one of the things I hear said, sometimes we need wisdom, not wounds. Okay, share your wisdom, not your wounds. Share your wisdom, not your wounds. Sometimes I know that you might think, well, you don't have the kids that I've got, but I work with kids so much and I just know the answer is just come alongside of them. Encouragement for us is the same. When someone encourages us and speaks good words to us, it makes us want to do the right thing. And some of us might struggle to do the right thing. But when we're loved and when we're in a great environment, if you want to be connected to, to kids in the, in the church, if you want to be connected to kids in the community, then I'm just encouraging you, see them as human beings. Reach out to them with the love of Jesus. We are the salt of the earth. And when they come into our kids club, you know, I love when I look at fun day photos, I've got like, you know, 20 odd leaders. There's no way your kid had an opportunity to drown there. All around them. And go and have a look at the photos. If you look in the back of the photos, you'll see so many parents all on their phone in the back of the photo. Now, I know parenting isn't easy and I know that times are changing, but when you decide to have children, you take on a responsibility for the next 18 years to love and raise and look after them. 
and, and encourage them and speak words. And yes, it's hard. And kids sometimes will go, well, I didn't ask to be born. Well, it's true. They didn't, okay? We made a decision. And if you're finding it hard, find someone that's gone before you. Find someone who can help you to go, yeah, I'm going to help you get through this. Look at the kids that you come in contact with in our community and in our church and in your life and in your shopping center and just go, I want to show the love of Jesus. Jesus is saying, they are are so precious. We sing that song to our children. No, Jesus loves you. This I know. Jesus loves you. And when you look at those little kids, and some of them might be 17, 18, remember to yourself, Jesus loves them. And what he wants me to do is be connected to them. What he wants me to be able to do is show them a way into the kingdom of God. I'm going to finish. I've got so much more I want to share with you, but I'm going to finish. We maybe do some more stuff on kids um, because they're so important. But so are we as parents. I know it's hard being a parent sometimes. But that's why we have a church. That's why we can stand united. That's why we can be together. Marriage isn't easy, but that's why we have a church and that's why we have friends that are going to strengthen us in our marriage. Life is not easy. That's why we have a church. That's why we have our friends around us. Amen.